Hello everyone, this is Jerry Molesky, Range and Forward Specialist with UNL West Central Research and Extension Center in North Platte. Uh, welcome today's, to today's webinar. Uh, this will be the first in a, in a four-part series dealing with the overall topic of irrigated pasture. Today we'll specifically talk about the different perennial forages that we might use for irrigated pasture. Now, there's been renewed interest in irrigated pasture, um, brought in part by uh, several factors. First of all, being the high demand or strong demand for pasture. As you can see here in the uh, survey results of, pas of cash rental rates for pasture, the, the big increase we saw in, in 2014 and likely going to be high or remain high here coming into 2015. And then, of course, we've had the uh, last year or two, relatively low um, grain commodity prices. Now, when we're thinking about some irrigated pasture, there's a few general planning and management uh, considerations that I think we should keep in mind. The first being just what are our grazing, forage, and hay needs, how we might use that irrigated pasture within our operation, also the site selection, where it's going to be, and how you're going to and develop that uh, livestock fence and water. And of course, the, the forage type, getting it established. Then once we're up and going, how about the irrigation and fertilizer and grazing management that we'll do. So forage choices as far as perennials, we have the option of either cool season or warm season. The cool seasons, of course, in the graph here on the upper right, uh, the cool seasons are, or I should say, their their pattern of growth is illustrated by the blue line, where they'll begin their initial growth in the spring, usually in late March to early April. Uh, very rapid growth during the month of May and early June. They will decline in their growth rate during the warm summer months, but pick up again a little bit during the fall when uh, temperatures cool down. Warm season grasses. On the other hand, uh, they have their initial growth occurring in May, uh, pretty much a bell-shaped curve where during that latter part of uh, June into early July is when they have their most rapid growth. And then by um, early September, have uh, pretty well uh, completed their growing for that particular uh, season and they will have a very little additional growth uh, once we reach that point. And warm seasons, of course, once we have first frost, uh, uh, go dormant or begin going into dormancy relatively quickly. Now, some of the standard uh, mixes that are out there, an old one that we call a four-way grass mix, includes things like a orchard grass, a meadow brome, smooth brome grass, and creeping foxtail. Uh, this has been a, a uh, around for, for many years and has been uh, proven to be a, a fairly successful mixture. Um, overall, with the cool season grasses, we tend to see more of those being used in, in, uh, in irrigated pasture uh, compared to the warm seasons, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. In this particular four-way mix here, I also indicate that alfalfa or some other legume should be or could be an option. Some of the numbers here I'm just showing are from uh, plot trials here at, at North Platte, uh, giving the respective yield in dry matter tons per acre for the different uh, four different species shown here. Uh, intermediate wheat grasses uh, can also have a place as in irrigated pasture. Uh, here I'm just showing a, an intermediate and a pubescent, and one called the new high hybrid wheat grass. Uh, the wheat grasses in general um, do have a very good spring production. Uh, by that I mean May and, and June. Uh, compared to some of the other cool season grasses, I've noticed they don't produce very, as well during the, the heat of the summer. A couple of the others, uh, uh, some of the others that uh, might have uh, potential, we have a uh, uh, endophyte free tall fescue shown here. Um, high core fesculodium is a um, tall fescue ryegrass hybrid. Uh, in trials here at North Platte for, for both of these species, I found that they were very productive and they did have uh, excellent uh, longer term persistence. 
rye grasses or perennial rye grasses. There's a number of different varieties of those are, that, are, that are available. Uh, one of the things I've noticed with the rye grasses is uh, they do establish very easily and quickly. They're a longer term persistent over several years uh, is, is relative poor. Yeah, the there's a few of the others that uh, we've done some work with. Uh, this one, one called the last row. Uh, again, very good producer, but uh, longer term persistence was, was relatively weak. Uh, things like wild rye or timothy could certainly be included as part of a, of, of a mixture as well. Just some more data here from, from uh, 2005, again here in plot trials showing very good productivity. And in our system here, we were harvesting these uh, um, mechanically as if they were hay, but we did that three harvests either in uh, late May, uh, late July or early August, and then again in uh, late October or November. These are fully irrigated stands, uh, four years old. And you can see we were uh, having production of about seven to eight and a half tons per acre for these different species. about uh, using a mixture versus a, a single species and one of the things I tend to really favor is the use of a mixture. There's some reasons here why mixtures uh, in, in my opinion have a, a little bit better advantages than rather than just a monoculture. With that mixture we can have adaptability to the variable soils or moisture conditions across the field. Now, even all of these, though all of these might be cool season grasses, they can have a little bit of difference in their growth pattern across the season. Then also within or between each of the species, there can be differences in their persistence or um, disease and insect resist resistance, as well as winter hardiness. Also, another important point is the growth form of some of these different grasses. Uh, we can have both bunch grasses and sod forming grasses. And in this next photo here, three-year-old stands of, of creeping foxtail and orchard grass, you can see that the orchard grass as a bunch grass, um, three years later, you can still row it up the original grill rows. The bunches of orchard grass do increase in diameter over time, but it can take quite a while before we'll have a complete sod coverage. The creeping foxtail here on the right, as underground rhizomes from which new chillers arise. And you can see in the photo here that it has uh, thickened itself up quite well and, and made a really nice sod. So including both sod formers and, or, and bunch grasses in a mixture, I think is very important. Just an example of uh, an irrigated pasture mix here using uh, six different grasses plus uh, alfalfa as a, as a legume in there. We have some orchard grass, fetulolium, tall fescue, metabrome, smooth brome, and creeping foxtail as the grasses. Then I give some suggested uh, pounds per acre seeding rates of each of these on, and then also in a seed on a seed per square foot basis. I also did have an estimate here of, of the approximate cost per acre and so with the uh, Prices I was looking at almost $56 per acre for this particular piece of cool season grasses and alfalfa. Seeding rates, um, this, this particular one came out to be a total of 20 pounds per acre, but I think uh, this can vary a little bit depending on the species we use, the mixture we use, because some of the different species have uh, markedly different uh, seed sizes and, and numbers of seeds per pound. But, if you're in that uh, anywhere from 16, 17 to 20, 22 pounds per acre, I think we're, we're in the ballpark. And then on the seeds per square foot basis, if we're in that 100, 110 to 130, that's uh, most likely where we want to be. Again, keep in mind that these vary by the speed as well as the time of year. Uh, some of the varieties have different costs. And then, of course, uh, the dealers might have slight variation in what they charge. There are a number of commercially available pasture mixes out there. I've got some uh, shown here in the different boxes. 
uh, these Buehler mixes um, have the percentage of each of the species that would be included in there. Uh, you'll notice this here one in the lower right uh, has a intermediate and pubescent wheatgrass combination that uh, work quite well. Uh, oftentimes, if we have really limited irrigation water, uh, the intermediate wheatgrass mixtures work, work very well. Other commercially available mixes shown here. Uh, the first one, upper left, is just a meadow, meadow grove and orchard grass mixture. You'll notice uh, it says 75% meadow and 25% orchard grass. But one of the things about the orchard grass is, orchard grass is that it is a, a, has a relatively small seed. So the numbers of seeds of orchard grass for each pound compared to meadow would be quite um, um, quite different. And in fact, in a case like this, we might see the available forage being about 50% orchard grass and 50% meadow grove, even though the percent in the seed was uh, this different as shown here. A little bit about legumes. Uh, I mentioned alfalfa earlier, which is probably one of the more common and most productive and easy to establish the view. Things like red or white clover can certainly be used as well. Birds for tree foil or even sites for milk pitch. For some people um, concerned with alfalfa or some of these other legumes can of course be bloat. Certainly that, that is a concern, uh, particularly if we have a considerable amount of alfalfa in there. But I think in most cases if we use a relatively small amount of alfalfa in the seed mixture, that being in the one to two pounds per acre uh, neighborhood. Uh, the amount of available forage being alfalfa still may be only in that 10 to 20 percent area, and that would really uh, minimize any potential risk of growth. And in most cases, when I see grazing of irrigated pastures that does have, have alfalfa in it, um, they don't necessarily select for the alfalfa right off, uh, right readily. One of the nice things about birds for tree for all was the here it is is that it is a uh, both safe legume has a high amount of lignin in it, so will not uh, um, uh, cause bloat in the grazing animals. And of course, overall, the idea with legumes is that we're hoping that they add some nitrogen to our uh, pasture mix, so by the nitrogen fixation that the beans do. And hopefully that would uh, offset some of the um, commercial nitrogen fertilizer that we would want to apply to uh, really have a substantial grass growth. Just a couple things on more limited irrigation system situations. Uh, here I describe eight to 12 inches of irrigation water line. And of course, any of the cool season grasses that we've talked about before, as well as uh, warm season grasses certainly have the potential to produce quite well with that amount of water. In, in very limited irrigation situations in a four or even less, four to eight inch uh, uh, irrigation water supply, some people tend to favor the use of the wheat grasses. Um, they're known for they're known for having a pretty extensive and deep rooting systems and just being a little bit more drought tolerant in general. Again, with the wheat grasses, uh, keep in mind uh, their most production occurs uh, with their initial growth at uh, May and early June period. And so, in this type of uh, management case, uh, if we were dealing with very limited water, we certainly want to be applying water in that spring time of the year to get the most efficient uh, response and growth from them. Uh, just a photo here showing uh, an inter inter intermediate wheatgrass uh, and pubescent wheatgrass mixture in, in western Nebraska um, in, in late May being grazed. A little bit about the warm season for your grasses. Uh, I mentioned earlier the warm seasons have that bell-shaped uh, growth curve in terms of beginning growth in May and ending in uh, early September. 
switchgrass, big blue stem, and Indian grass are probably the three primary warm season grasses that we might uh, uh, see or use under an irrigated situation. Now, um, overall though, again, I still think if we compare cool seasons and warm seasons in terms of uh, different characteristics uh, under irrigation, I think the cool seasons have the advantage. Um, a few of the lines here point some of these things out. They have a longer growing period with the cool seasons compared to the warms. Establishment time is a little bit shorter for the cool seasons. Seed cost uh, compared to uh, warm seasons is a bit lower. They do not, of course, uh, the cool seasons, they do have that summer, summer slowdown, whereas the warm seasons uh, do quite well during the heat of the summer. But other things here, like this response to irrigation water, response to fertilizer, persistence under grazing, cool season grasses um, generally have the advantage in, in, in those categories. Some people ask, uh, what about mixing cool and warm season grasses together? I um, generally don't favor that. Uh, it does present some challenges uh, when it comes to our planting and establishment, irrigating and fertilizing, as well as the grazing part of it as well. Um, and generally, the cool season species tend to dominate over time. Now, I have worked with some people that have planted separate acres of, of cool and warm season grasses on irrigation. Uh, typically, the, the proportion of that is about 75% uh, cool season and 25% warm season acres. So managing something like this, one of course would be grazing those cool seasons uh, initially in the spring and early summer. Uh, when the warm seasons came on, they would rotate over to those acres and potentially uh, rotate back and forth a couple of times as needed over the summer to, to balance the grazing. And then certainly in the in the fall of the year, um, be back uh, primarily on the cool season grasses. Well, there's additional uh, information available on uh, the topic of irrigated pasture uh, at the UNL Extension Publications website. It's www.extension.unl.edu, or feel free to give me a telephone call at area code 308-696. 6710. Thank you.